you have your Bibles today and you would join me in Matthew 22, Matthew the 22nd chapter, verses 35 through 40, Matthew the 22nd chapter. Verses 35 through 40. All right. I'm talking for a little, little while today on the topic, Hung Up on Law. Matthew 22, 35 through 40. It is on the screen ahead of you as we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And the King James text today reads... Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Talking about hung up on law. If you bow your heads with me one more quick moment. Master, we love you, God, and we ask, Lord, right now that your anointing, your presence, your power would rest upon your messenger. Help me, God, to deliver this simple short word of exhortation that you've laid upon my heart. Let the people of God be receptive. Let us have a mind to receive, Lord, and not only to hear, but to receive the word of God that we might walk away from this place with every intention and with every effort to live that which we have heard, not merely to hear God, but to allow it to become a very part of our existence. Oh, Master, how we need you this hour, how we need you in our lives, how we need your help, Lord, to live a life that is a testimony to an unsaved world. Oh, Master, anoint this hour, not only those in this place, but those as well, who might be viewing by reason of the internet. For we ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. I only have about half an hour, maybe not even quite half an hour, if I'm going to keep us on time. Well, that's okay, because as I've said, this is merely a word of exhortation. I don't have notes. The Lord laid this passage on my heart. And so that's all I've really got to work with is what uh, he, the passage that he gave me. A lawyer came to the Lord. What is a lawyer? Now, we think we know what a lawyer is based upon the modern concept of a lawyer. But a lot of people don't seem to understand, Martin, that uh, Israel had a very unique and unusual relationship with God. It is a relationship that is not uh, recreated in any other nation on this planet. God only made a covenant with Abraham. You can try to make America into something unique and something special and something with a divine purpose all you want to. I've got news for you. You're standing on shaky biblical ground. There is only one nation in all of planet Earth that is built upon a covenant and a relationship with Almighty God, and that is the nation of Israel. One of the mistakes that many people in Christendom today make, they do not understand that when God gave the law to Moses, it was not entirely a religious law. It was in part, but not entirely. 
When you look at the Ten Commandments, well, the Ten Commandments are basically the basis for any good, solid, secular legal thinking, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. These are all things you don't need to have any kind of a spiritual consciousness. You don't need to have any kind of a religious background to understand that these things are morally wrong. These are things that harm others. These are things that bring destruction and devastation into people's lives. And therefore, uh, they have no business, you know, people have no business engaging in these kind of activities. So the law was a mixture of secular law with spiritual law. There were religious aspects to the law, and there were very secular aspects to the law. I got a kick about, oh, probably maybe a year or so ago during the election. I had an uncle who I used to think very highly of. I don't want anything new with him anymore, based on some of the foolishness I read on his Facebook during the course of this election. But I used to hold an uncle by marriage in very high esteem, thought an awful lot of him. I was there when he came to the Lord in the church that I grew up in. And I remember him evolving from a wife beater to a godly Christian husband, I, you know. And, and I had a lot of respect for this man. But he really makes me laugh because uh, at one point, Someone was having a conversation about how, you know, the Word of God says we're to uh, receive the, the stranger. You know, we're supposed to uh, accept those who come from other places and other lands, and we're to be hospitable to them. And that was part of the law of Moses. Interestingly enough, God did not tell the people of Israel that they were not to receive people of other faiths. See, when you live this thing right, other faiths don't offend you and other faiths don't cause you to be fearful. Because if America were living what America claims, these people would be coming to America and finding Jesus. That's right. Uh -huh. The problem is we're not living it, and because we're not living it, the Muslims who come to America aren't interested in our Christianity. The Buddhists who come to America are not interested in our Christianity. The Hindus who come to our America are not interested in our Christianity because the way we live our Christianity is not a way that would make anybody want to take part in it. That's right. It's like Gandhi once said, he said, your Christ I like. He said, your Christians I'm not so crazy about. I paraphrase. So yeah, when I read the Bible and I read all about this Jesus, I don't have a problem with that guy, but I sure do have problems with those who claim to be followers of that guy. Because they don't look anything like him. Well, as I've said before, you, you cannot legitimately call yourself a Christian if you don't look like Christ. Because the term Christian means Christ-like. That's right. But now the thing that's interesting is somebody made a comment about, you know, how the Word of God said we're to receive strangers. And the Word of God said we're to care for the poor. And as is so often the custom with fundamentalists, you know, my uncle piped in and said, well, you know, but that's, that's at a personal level. That doesn't have anything to do with, you know, uh, secular law and government and how government should do things. And I thought to myself, boy, you couldn't be any more wrong. You couldn't be any more wrong. All those laws that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, all of those directions and instructions were for the people of Israel not to establish a religious law. No, it was to help them establish their secular governmental law when they reached the land of promise. Right. Therefore, if you want to know how a country, a nation, ought to conduct itself in order to please God, uh -uh. 
then you have to look at the model that was given to us within the law of Moses. And I got news for you. That model includes taking care of the poor. That model includes things that you don't see any Republicans fighting for in America today, like doing away with usury. That's one issue that gets in my craw. Oh, I tell you, if there's anything irritates me, it is how in this country the poor are so taken advantage of. Uh -huh. Yes. Every dime they've got is wrangled out of their hands and put into the coffers of the richest of the rich. And it's not right, and it's not fair, and where in the name of Jesus are our lawmakers so that this foolishness can be called to a stop? Amen. That's right. God told his people, don't you dare do this. Don't you dare use usury to take advantage of one another. Don't you dare charge enormous amounts of interest. No. If you look at the law of Moses, you'll see that God designed it in such a manner that it was based on national unity. It was based on a certain level of patriotism. It was based on the notion that as a nation, we are family. And we're going to care for one another. We're going to take care of one another. We're going to make provision for those who are having a tough time. We're going to provide a safety net for those who are struggling. Because why? Because, bless God, we're Americans. And there is no way in this world I'm going to let any person that's part of my nation, part of my country, part of my family suffer unnecessarily. I'm going to do everything in my power as a citizen of this country to make sure, Lisa, that people have every opportunity to achieve and to succeed and to be blessed. Amen? Oh, I'm going to tell you, if we approached our civic law, if we approached our government according to the teaching of the law of Moses, you you wouldn't recognize the United States of America. You think we're the richest country on the planet now? You think we're the richest country on the planet now? You wouldn't believe what would happen in this country if we would approach our civic law, our government, according to the law of Moses. But Jesus was approached this day by a man who has identified as a lawyer. You see, there were people within the nation who studied the law. There were people who represented others in issues dealing with the law, just like we have today. But the law of Moses, as I've stated, had not only a secular element, but it also had a religious element. You look at the first five laws uh, in the Ten Commandments, and they dealt with man's relationship with God. You look at the last five, you see they had to do with man's relationship with man. Do you know we've still got lawyers in the church? And I don't mean men and women who've gone to university. I don't mean men and women who've gone to Yale or gone to Harvard or gone to Princeton so they can study law. No, no, no. I mean people in the church who are still hung up on the law of Moses. Uh -huh. And they spend more time talking about the law of Moses. But I'm going to tell you something about a lawyer. A good lawyer, my friend, doesn't just study those parts of the law that please them. No, because when you do that, you'll find yourself being shot down in court real fast. Because law is a very specific thing. You know, anybody who knows me knows I like Boston Legal. Now listen, I am more than aware that Boston Legal is an overly simplified representation of the legal process. I, I might look dumb, but I'm really not as dumb as I look. Okay, 
I am fully aware that it is a much more simplified version. Uh, there, listen, you couldn't have a TV show that portrayed the legal system the way it actually operates because it would take years and years and years for you to finally find out what happened with this case that started in season one. You wouldn't find out how it finished up till you got to season 14, you know. So in order to expedite the storyline, you know, they portray things moving a whole lot more quickly. And, you know, and they portray things being said in court that you and I both know a judge would stop them and say, no, nope, you can't go there. You can't say that. I'm aware of all that. I just love the fact that you get to watch a television program that, intelligently, wisely articulate some very good arguments, uh, oftentimes on both sides of an issue. Not just one, but on both sides of an issue. And I enjoy hearing, uh, I enjoy hearing sometimes the hypocrisy of our nation being called out. Alan Shore is famous for that. Standing in front of the Supreme Court and telling all the justices off, <laughs> letting every one of them know where their uh, conflicts of interest lie and all that. You know, it'd be wonderful if such a thing could really happen. Unfortunately, we know it can. But I sure can enjoy it in fiction anyway, can I? But when you study law, you understand you cannot merely embrace those parts of the law that please you and ignore those parts that don't work for you. Well, I'm going to introduce this evidence uh, during the course of the trial. I'm not going to show it to the, uh, to the other attorney. I'm not going to show it to the other guys. I'm just going to let my guy on the stand whip something out of his pocket and show it. And boy, that's how it's going to work. No, try it and see how well you, you get away with it. It's not going to happen. Why? Because there's rules. There's laws. There are... Uh, ways that these things have to be done. And if they're not done in that manner, then you lose out. You're not going to be able to use that evidence at all. So you better do things right. What cracks me up about people in the church who are hung up on the law is they love to think they can make up the rules as they go. That's why I say it cracks me up how there are those uh, fundamentalists who talk about, well, bless God, we ought to just kill queers like they did in the Old Testament. Oh, really? You moron. You don't even know what the law says about how to go about doing these things. And they didn't kill queers. That's right. First of all, there is not one single woman in human history who was ever stoned within the context of the Old Testament law for being a lesbian. I got news for you. There is not one single man throughout human history within the context of the Hebrew law who was stoned for being a homosexual. No. No. There is nothing illegal about being a homosexual. There was nothing within the law that said one could not be, listen to me now, a practicing homosexual. Not just, we're not going to go down the Catholic road. Well, yes, you can be one, bless God, just don't do anything about it. No. No. The most conservative reading of the Old Testament law says that there was one act and one act only, and it was only an act that could be committed between men. Amen. There is not one word spoken about women within the context of the Old Testament law. So these foolish people who consider themselves Jack lawyers who are so hung up on the law, what's interesting is they are so ignorant and so uninformed, they don't even know that very law that they love to quote and they love to tell. They have no idea how it works. They have no idea how it was applied. Yeah. And this is why this preacher is at the end of his wits half the time, because I hear the stupidity and it just makes me so angry and makes me so upset because I know the details. 
I've spent enough time looking into these matters to understand them. And you know, as they say, the people who are the loudest are usually the most ignorant. Mm -hmm. The people, you know, the, the one that makes the most noise is generally the one that knows the least. So when you see these preachers on television, when you hear these politicians on television, and you read something ignorant and foolish they've said in the newspaper, just remember, they that are loudest are also the dumbest. So don't let them trouble you. Don't let them bother you. But Jesus told us in response to this lawyer's inquiry, the Lord Jesus Christ let us know there are two primary principles that govern the entire Mosaic law. He said, first of all, you love God with everything you've got with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That takes effort, folks. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Amen, I preached the message. It's been some years back. I highly doubt Martin was there to hear it. I know Tammy and Rose were not. I know Lisa, you weren't. But I preached a message some time back and I talked about how the Word of God said, Husbands, love your wives. Well, I got news for you. That very statement implies that it's an issue of choice. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's right. That's right. That very statement. God would not command you to do something that you could not purpose to do. God's not going to tell you, you know, if I say to you, tie your shoes, well, that's because you have the ability to tie your shoes. I'm not going to look at somebody who has no arms and say, hey, tie your shoes. No, there's no way in the world that person can tie their shoes. God does not command us to do something that we're incapable of doing. No, what the Word of God is telling us is, if you're married and you have a spouse it is within your power, listen to me now, to decide to love them. Uh -huh. Well, I just fell out of love. We were in love once, but I fell out of love. No, you changed your mind. You didn't fall out of love. You changed your mind. At one time, you had a mind to love them. You no longer have a mind to love them. Most of the time, it's because you found somebody else to have a mind to love. Uh -huh. Let's be truthful. When the Word of God said, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all thy mind, that implies that there is effort. You know, Martin, there's a reason I go to church on Sunday. There's a reason I go to church on Wednesday. There's a reason that I make myself available to the house of God. There's a reason I listen to the word of God. Because if I'm going to be able to love the Lord with all that I have, then I'm going to have to put all that I have into this relationship. I cannot expect to love God with everything that I have if I'm only willing to give God half an effort. Right. Hello now. Oh, my goodness. Well, I can be a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can be a Christian without going to church, but you can't grow in Christ without going to church. That's right. You can't grow in faith without going to church. That's you right. can't be part of the body without going to church. You can't fellowship with the saints without going to church. And these are all things God wants you to do. You want to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind. Oh, I love the Lord with everything I have. I just don't go to church. I love the Lord with everything I have. I just don't read the Bible. I love the Lord with everything I have. I just don't talk to Him. I don't pray. Hello now. Do you really? Boy, I'd hate to think what would happen if you loved your husband as much as all that. Oh, I love my husband with all my mind, all my mind, all my soul. We just don't get intimate. I love my husband with all my mind and all my mind and all my soul. We just don't talk. I love my husband with all my might and all my mind and all my soul. I just don't cook anything for him when he's hungry. Hello now. 
No. All of these things are the byproduct of that love. Am I telling the truth? You see, your love is demonstrated in your effort. And when you love, you put forth the effort. And if when you're feeling the love, you put forth the effort, you'll find that it isn't too hard to keep feeling the love. But too many people, I've told this, I've said this many times, too many people, when they find that life partner, they find that spouse, that mate, they wind up letting all kinds of other things step in and draw away their attention and take all their time. Some people will put all kinds of effort into their employment, into their job, into their career. But where's the effort when it comes to your spouse? Oh no, they, they, I'm too tired. Then they wonder why hubby runs off and cheats. They wonder why wife runs off and has an affair. Because you put all your effort. You know what? It might, it might not have hurt you to have left work an hour earlier so you could go home and be intimate with your husband or your wife. Oh my goodness, did I say that? Yeah. Because if you want something to work and if you want something to be everything that it needs to be, that it should be, it takes effort. And if you find that putting all your effort into this basket over here draws away from your ability to put in the right amount of effort over here, then you need to figure out a way to shave some of the effort off over here so you'll have more effort to give over here. Hello now. Same thing goes for serving God. If you find you've got too much going on in your life, if your school, if your job, if your family, if whatever you've got going on is drawing you away from your ability to invest in your relationship with God, you've got too much going on. You need to find a way to shape some things. I'm going to tell you, it never hurt a parent to tell a child, pick a sport, any sport. You don't have to play all of them. Right. Hello now. Right. Well, my son plays soccer. My son plays football. My son plays baseball. My son plays hockey. My son plays tennis. And I've got to go to all these games. No, see, there's where you've got a problem. You've allowed your family to become far too active. There's far too much going on. It is not necessary. That your child be in every sport, every season, doing everything. It is not necessary, folks. Oh, Pastor, you're not supposed to say that. Well, too late, I already did it. <laughs> Secondly, the Lord said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is summed up in what we often refer to as the golden rule. Whatsoever ye would that men do unto you, do ye even so unto them. Do to other people what you would like other people to do to you. It's that simple. It's that simple. Jesus said on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you hung up on the law? You hung up on the law? Well I got news for you. I can save you a lot of work. Instead of going back into Leviticus, instead of going back into Deuteronomy, instead of studying the words that Moses penned, what you need to do is look right here at Matthew 22, because Jesus said on these two principles hang all the law and the prophets. But if you're hung up on the law, there's only two things you need to know. Love the Lord with everything you've yeah. got. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said on these things hang all the law and the prophets. So if you're hung up on the law, then this simple passage right here, will help to keep it nice and simple and compact for you. And if Christians would learn to live like this, give God the effort, make the yeah. effort so that your relationship with God is passionate. Yeah. Make the effort so that your relationship with God has depth and substance to it. And then in your dealings with other human beings, treat people the way you would like to be treated. Now what cracks me up is how many Christians are so dishonest with themselves. Why that aunt of mine who just, you know, let me know that my hug was not required. 
I'm sure if you asked her, would you like people to do you that way? Well, if I was a homosexual, I most certainly would. Oh, really? Well, unless you are gay, then chances are you're not gay. That kind of just stands to reason. And uh, how about if they do it to you because they don't like fat people? How about if they do it to you because you're a single woman? I remember a time growing up in church when a woman who was divorced, dear God, had mercy. Ooh, she didn't dare hug the neck of any of the men in the church. I'm going to tell you right now. Because their wives would come over and scratch their eyes out. Oh no, because a woman who was divorced was on the prowl. She was looking to take your husband. She was looking to find her a man. That was the, ma that was the mindset. That's how people thought. So you wouldn't mind if people did you the way you did me. Not, not, you see, you're, these people love to be specific here. Well, yes, if I were. Well, no. What if they had a different reason, but their reason was just as valid to them as your reason is to you? I don't like fat people. I, and I'm not trying to be mean because I'm fat. But you know there are people in the world that well, those people stink. You know, fat people have an odor of that. I mean, fat people are really, you know. You know, they got all kinds of ideas and thoughts in their head. Am I telling the truth? I know I am. I've heard people say things like that, you know. I don't want to be hugging up on her because... Blah, 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 blah. You see, the truth of the matter is if we would treat people the way we'd like to be treated, then we would have a world that would be such so much greater a place. We would have a church that was able to win the lost. We would have a community that was able to get along, to disagree in principle, and yet still be able to stand in unity and stand as family. So I can disagree with family, but I can still love them because they're family. I'm going to tell you something. One of the biggest problems we have in our country today, and I am closing this up, is the fact that certain people in this country can look at that Mexican man down the street, that Hispanic man or that Asian woman, they can look at that person and they do not see a fellow American. That's right. That's right. I'm going to tell you. That's right. I'm going to tell you. I do. I do see a fellow American. I've had people in my car. I've had a, I had a young uh, man, I told you a few, several weeks back now, uh, in my Uber, you know, I was taking him in an Uber, and he was obviously a Muslim descent. And we were talking, and I told him, and I said, I just want to tell you, there's room in my America for you. I said, in, in the America I live in, you're welcome. And there's room for you, as I don't have any problem with you. I don't have to agree with you, and I don't. I don't have to believe like you do, and I don't. See, Lisa, that's another problem we have. We've got those on the left who, who want to make out like we're not supposed to have any beliefs. We're not supposed to have any convictions. We're not supposed to have anything different one from the other. No, 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 no. No, difference is not the issue. How we handle our differences is the issue. I don't have to believe the way you believe to still be able to love you and accept you as a member of our nation, as a citizen of this country. I, I don't, you know, you don't have to be a born again Christian for me to understand you're an American. Right. You follow what I'm saying? But see, I, I want to do people the way I want to be done. And the way I want to be done, I want to be treated with respect, I want to be treated yeah. with dignity. Yeah. I want to be able to agree, agree to disagree. I want to be able to cooperate and get along even when we have differences of opinion and differences of belief and differences of conviction. That's what I want to do. That's how I try to treat people. Well, we, we don't have to believe just exactly like that. My, one of my best friends in the world from Scotland, bless her heart, she is an ardent socialist. 
I mean full-blown socialist. And she's an animal rights activist. Now, it ain't nobody on this planet likes steak more than I do. And I'm sorry that if I go to the restaurant and they got veal on the menu, it's dead anyway. That's right. If I don't eat it, somebody else will. I, 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 I know, bless her heart, I know Fiona's not watching, so otherwise she'd be mad at me. But you know what's so funny? I met this girl, we talked, and we became the best of friends, and you never met two people who were more different and more opposite than one another. The only thing we had in common was we both embraced the principle, treat others the way you want to be treated. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And do you know that by she and I both embracing that principle, we get along marvelously. <laughs> we approach things politically, we approach things completely opposite one another. We have views that are completely opposite one another, but we get along wonderfully. Why? Because we believe in treating people the way we want to be treated. And it's amazing, when you put two people who both embrace that principle, you put them together, it doesn't matter how different they are. It's amazing how well they can get along. I love that girl. I love, I would, I would, honestly, I would throw myself in front of a bus for that girl if I thought it would save her life. I would. I value our friendship. I am so grateful for all the years that I've known her. She has brought so much into my life. Another thing you learn when you learn to just treat people with respect and dignity and to love people whether you agree with them or not, another thing that tends to happen is they're able to bring things into your life that you might not otherwise have ever been exposed to. There are things that different people in my life, when I look back over the years, you know, this person exposed me to this movie or to this book or to this film or, you know, or to this music, and, and, and it changed my life. It literally changed my life. Or maybe they encouraged me to do something that I was afraid to do. Or maybe they encouraged me to do something that I couldn't find the courage to do. And, you know, all, and, and we didn't agree on everything. We didn't look at things the same way. But we agreed on the primary things. Two things the law hinges on. You want to talk about being hung up on the law? Then this is all you need to be hung up on right here. Right. This is it. Christian, right. this is it. You need look no further. That's right. Look no further. Don't be quoting any Leviticus at me. You start quoting Leviticus at me, that tells me you want people quoting Leviticus at you. And I got news for you. If you're divorced and remarried, you don't want me quoting Leviticus at you. That's right. If you're engaged in a business that in truth employs usury, you don't want me quoting Leviticus at you. If you're trying everything in your power to keep people out of this country who are poor or who are different or who believe differently, you don't want me quoting Leviticus to you. Take my word for it. Hung up on the law. This is all the law you need to know. Because all the law is hung on these two principles. Would you stand with me this evening?